Greetings class, Professor Steve here. And for our last lesson in the um, heterotrophic unit, um, we're going to start to bring things full circle. Uh, so now, up until now, you have, or by this point, you have a lot of the basic pieces, you know, a little bit about the chemistry, a little bit about the biology and the processes that happen between them to start to, 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 to come full circle, to draw a big picture. And it's all about energy flow. It's all about taking sunlight um, that hits the earth uh, and and mobilizing it because if 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 we didn't have the processes we've gone over so far sunlight would hit the earth it would heat the earth and it would radiate back off as as wasted heat unless we had phytoplankton or all the other photosynthesizing autotrophs but in the ocean it's phytoplankton to mobilize that energy they take co2 out of the atmosphere to, for their carbon to build their structures but they use sunlight energy they trap it on Earth and mobilize it into organic, into a form of organic matter um, that could, that that consists of carbon and and all the other nutrients necessary for growth, which we now know is then uh, transferred along, is cycled along by being consumed by an herbivore like a copepod, and then so on and so forth up the trophic food chain. But this is the initial source of energy to the Earth. And without this process here, and then transfer, we don't have this cycling. <clears throat> Looking at it in another way, we can look at our um, trophic pyramid again, what we call an Eltonian pyramid. And we have phytoplankton trapping the sunlight and, and um, turning inorganic carbon into organic carbon, which is then eaten by an herbivore, the first level consumer, which is then eaten by a, a, another consumer, which is eaten by a top level consumer. Uh, and the important thing to, to note is, so we can have many different levels in here depending on who's doing the consuming, right? We know we can go from phytoplankton to a krill, uh, essentially straight to um, a whale and make this a three level pyramid, or we can go from a phytoplankton to a protist to a copepod, to a small fish, to a big fish, to an even bigger fish, and we can have many more levels here. And the importance, the significance there is that we only get this 10% transfer. So 100 units of phytoplankton will only make 10 units of the first level consumer, one unit of the next level, and a tenth of a unit in, in this particular uh, pyramid setup. But the second important thing is that this biomass eventually decomposes and the 90% missing from these transfers is waste and they all go into this recirculating scheme. Right? So inorganic carbon is trapped, um, sunlight is mobilized into energy, it's transferred up to here, it goes into these atmospheric or terrestrial pools, these inorganic and some organic pools that we didn't talk about, and is then recycled again. And that is essentially the basic flow of energy. And <clears throat> we talk about a phytoplankton, a consumer, uh, a, a another secondary, and then a single top predator. But ecology is much more uh, complex than that. We have um, scenarios where you have multiple resources being competed for by one consumer. We have one resource being competed between two consumers. Um, and I don't want you to know the intricacies of these two specific types of competition that I've listed here, but I do want you to be familiar with the trophic cascade, which we've kind of gone over with, and the idea being that if you have a resource that's eaten by a first level consumer here, marked by an H, standing for herbivore, which is then consumed by a, um, a secondary consumer, so this could be phytoplankton, then copepod, and then a smaller fish, um, by this fish consuming the herbivore, it's actually impacting the phytoplankton by making having less herbivores to eat the phytoplankton. And so even though the consumer is not directly affecting, is only directly affecting the herbivore, it's indirectly affecting the resource. And we call that a trophic cascade. But now if you take this trophic cascade and you you envision that there are multiple resources possible, so multiple species of phytoplankton, multiple consumers, right? So multiple types of or species of herbivore that are eaten by multiple species of second level consumer, you see that it can become much more complex. <clears throat> and I only introduce that complexity now um, 
and we'll go into it in much greater detail in another lesson, but um, towards the end of the course. But but I in introduced that complexity now so that I could go over um, really the most basic uh, version of what a real food web or a real food chain looks like. Um, and just how complex it can be. And even this is just a simple one, pointing out one species in each level. So what we have here is what has been considered the classic food chain. Up until about 50 years ago, this was essentially thought to be the main path for energy in the ocean. So phytoplankton uh, traps sunlight and energy, is eaten by a zooplankton, like a copepod, which, which can then ultimately be eaten by a fish. So a three-level food chain is sort of the classic food chain. But you guys know enough now that you should be saying, wait a minute, that's, that's just not how it happens. Where does, where does the matter come from and where does it go to from each one of these pools? What about the bacteria? What about the protozoa? What about all these other consumers we've learned about? And the fact of the matter is that that exists in every food web, in every ecosystem. So each one of these guys becomes a pool of biomass, a pool of organic matter. Each one um, excretes, and, uh, causes waste, respires, and they also can die and decompose, right? These guys do it, these guys do it, these guys do it, and they eventually contribute to this gigantic pool that becomes a dissolved organic matter pool. So there's carbon in here, there's phosphorus, there's nitrogen, but it's this big dissolved pool. Now if no one could consume and mobilize this organic matter pool, this dissolved pool, then that's where the buck would stop. Eventually everything would die, become dissolved, and that energy would never be used or recycled again, and life would sort of end as we know it. But we know there's one class of organisms that can utilize this dissolved pool, and that's the bacteria. The bacteria are the only organisms that can really make use of the dissolved organic matter pools, and so that pool becomes bacterial biomass. Um, and then we would have the same problem. Bacterial biomass would just build up forever, um, and everything would eventually die, become dissolved, and then become bacteria until the world was up to its eyeballs in bacteria, and, and, and life would stop there as we know it if there wasn't something that could mobilize this pool, or in other words, consume it, and those are the protozoa, right? The, we call those bacterivores, something that eats bacteria. We learned about the heterotrophic trophic flagellates that can do that. We learned about ciliates that can do that. These are the primary consumers of bacteria. Some of them can eat each other. And then the majority of these guys can be eaten by something else. Some of the lower level zooplankton basically. Other microzooplankton, some copepods, and, and that sort of thing. So that's eventually what brings all this energy and organic matter full circle. We call this portion of the food web the microbial loop. You have it here, bigger letters here because it's a it's an important term to remember. So without this loop we just have the classic food chain. Phytoplankton, zooplankton, fish. But in every food chain is a microbial loop that fuels the recycling within that food chain. And without it organic matter becomes a dead end. So then the next thing in the energy flow is how does the energy flow between types and pools, right? How does it really go between an organic matter? Well, this is the thing that we really study. How does it really go flow? How does it become organic, inorganic, organic, inorganic, and back again? And then how does it change between pools, between, say, the land and the atmosphere, or the land and the ocean, or the atmosphere and the ocean? And the biggest example that I want you to understand is between the atmosphere and the ocean in a process that we call the biological carbon pump. Now, the bonus to you learning the biological carbon pump is that you already know it. You already know all the pieces, and now we're going to put it all together and, and learn its significance. The biological carbon pump, the first step in it is bringing CO2 from the atmosphere, so it's dissolved, that big D, it's inorganic carbon, CO2, in the atmosphere, into the ocean. Okay, this happens essentially through diffusion. CO2 um, diffuses readily into the ocean, especially where if there's in an area where CO2 is depleted in the ocean and it's high in the atmosphere, CO2 will just flux into the ocean and become dissolved in organic carbon, not in the atmosphere, but in this surface ocean. So the um, 
that CO2 that dissolved inorganic carbon in the ocean together with sunlight is taken up by uh, together taken up with sunlight eventually right so this process this arrow right here is diffusion this arrow right here is photosynthesis through photosynthesis that CO2 and sunlight is turned into phytoplankton right now it's organic carbon in the surface ocean and now that it's an organism it's not dissolved it's particulate right so it's particulate organic carbon in the form of phytoplankton which we know is eaten by uh, herbivores which are eaten by other guys which become different forms of organic particulate organic carbon now we know these guys waste some of the energy and transfer with 90 percent of it becomes respiration or excretion right so that that would be this some of that would would be uh, would be this arrow here that process respiration excretion would fuel right so when these guys respire they make co2 um, and other organic matter which would refuel fight uh, photosynthesis again so we can get some recycling here but everything that becomes a particulate organic carbon so essentially an organism they're gonna either they're gonna die uh, they're gonna excrete right make fecal pellets they're gonna poop and they're gonna die and be, start to be decomposed but they will become this gigantic pool of particulate organic carbon. Well, what happens to that? Again, it can be broken down and refuel this, but it also can become heavy enough to sink. Ah, so there's that term, sink, right? So if you remember our view of the organic carbon continuum, we said everything can die, stick together, we can get snot created, we can get excretion, we can get these hot spots, things sticking together, becoming heavy. Uh, we've talked about how fecal pellets or how organisms or their fecal pellets can become heavy. And if they become heavy enough, they sink out of the surface ocean. Now this is key and very important because what we'll learn after the first exam is that the ocean is broken up into two very distinct layers, a surface and a deep layer. And for something like organi like small organisms or dissolved and small particulate materials, it's very difficult to cross that barrier. So to become heavy enough or to actively be able to swim across that batter barrier into the deep ocean is kind of a big deal. So if particulate or ocean, if particulate organic carbon sinks from the surface to the deep, it becomes part of the deep particulate organic carbon pool. And the significance of that is that these, this separate deep layer of the ocean takes 1,000 years to circulate. Whoops, that's supposed to be a thousand, not a hundred. Mark, please mark that down. A thousand years. If so, if carbon that is once was CO2 in the atmosphere is transferred into the surface ocean, is turned into organic carbon, no matter how many times it's cycled through here, all ultimately becomes part of this particulate organic pool that then sinks into the deep ocean. That is the biological carbon pump. It is eventually removed from the atmosphere. So we've taken carbon from the atmosphere, moved it to the surface ocean, moved it to the deep, and that takes that carbon away from the atmosphere for a thousand years. That is the biological ocean carbon pump. <clears throat> now why is that significant? Well, you might start to ask yourself, what role does CO2 play in the atmosphere? Right, so if this is one method for removing CO2 from the atmosphere for at least a thousand years, now this is just removing it to the deep ocean. It says nothing about getting to the sediments, and we'll get to that at the end of the benthic lecture. But that is a good way of removing, say, excess CO2 from the atmosphere that humans might have put there. So I'd like you to be thinking along those lines. But for right now, I just want you to understand the details of what the biological carbon pump is. And all it is is following these arrows right here, right? We're moving CO2 into the deep, into the surface ocean, mobilizing it via biological processes that ultimately end up putting it in this POC pool, which ultimately can end up sinking into the deep, right? CO2 from the ocean to CH2O in the surface to CH2O in the deep means removal for a thousand years, and that's the biological carbon pump. And we will uh, we'll go over some processes uh, about the benthic realm and ecosystem in the next lecture and 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 then plug that part into this piece of uh, that piece of the puzzle into the, in, into this story as well and take it one step forward next next uh, next unit okay thanks for joining me see you next lesson